Well, as we turn our attention to the Lord and his word together, uh, would you please join with me in prayer? Lord God, we are so very thankful for who you are. We're thankful, Lord, for your goodness. We're thankful for your love. Lord, we're thankful for this opportunity we've been on. And we've taken advantage of these last few weeks as we've been focusing in on our life with Jesus. And Lord, we, we just pray, Lord, that you would continue to work in our hearts and minds, helping us to understand a little better, helping us to lean in a little more, helping us to meet you as we intentionally pursue you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us to a relationship. And Lord, we thank you that in that relationship, everything else flows. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that you intend for us in this relationship with Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the further equipping and empowering and encouragement for ministry as we engage more with Jesus. Lord, we thank you that all of our life, all those things you expect of us, flow out of that place of our relationship with Jesus. And we thank you for this time to zero in on that, focus in on that, perhaps unveil some areas of our life where we've taken that relationship for granted. Uh, and so, Lord, I, I thank you for countless stories already of people who have leaned in a little more, appreciated their life with Jesus a little better, uh, engaged with you in a way they never understood that they were supposed to before. And so for all those little victories, all those ways in which you're working in our lives here as a congregation, we give you thanks. Lord, I pray that today as well, as we continue on in this study, that you will continue to open our eyes to not take this for granted, but to lean in to this mutual and intentional relationship that you've called us to with Jesus. And Lord, we just thank you for this time and ask that you would be glorified in all that takes place, both the words that are preached from here, Lord, but also the meditations of our hearts and minds as we reflect on what your word has to say. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in case you don't know, you haven't been here, uh, you probably got some of it from my prayer, but we have been focusing in on our life with Jesus. I think that when we ask somebody, whether it's a member of our church or many other churches around the world, around the, at least our country, when we ask, what is the Christian life all about? We'll probably get a bunch of different answers. The Christian life is about going to church, about being a good person, about following the rules, about doing more good than bad, about any number of things. In fact, it's, it's kind of funny sometimes just how many answers you might get asking this question of people. And a lot of the things that we associate with our Christian life, even sharing the gospel, reading the Bible, praying, these kinds of things, all of those things are good. But foundational, foundational to everything, is that intentional and mutual relationship that we are in with Jesus Christ. He didn't just save us from something, he saved us into something, and it's in that relationship with him that everything that is expected of us flows. And so I, I gave a definition for life with Jesus, I wanna repeat it today. By life with Jesus, I mean this, that mutual and intentional relationship between us and Christ through which we continually grow in our understanding and experience of his love, in our desire to be obedient to him and to be transformed by him, and in our willingness to be on mission with him. Now, those are several aspects of the Christian life that are associated directly with our life with Jesus. And so last week we took a look at uh, growing in our understanding and experience of his love. We looked at some of the facets of, of, of God's love, God's love for the world, God's love for the redeemed Christians, right? And that relationship that he calls us to as his sons and daughters and what that means for us as we engage with him. We looked at what it means not just to be loved by God, but also to love God back. What is it? What does he call us to? How do we demonstrate that? How do we fulfill our part of this mutual relationship where we're not just the recipients of God's love, but that we also love him back as we would in any relationship that we're a part of. And, you know, when it comes to God's love, there's a lot of things that you can know intellectually, right? After all, God revealed it in his word. So there's a lot of things we can read about and learn about and understand about, but how many of us or how often in our lives do we dedicate ourselves, do we commit ourselves 
to experiencing God's love and the ways in which he set out to do that. And so this is what we talked about last week. And if you were able to be with us, I encourage you to go back and, and listen to that recording. But today I want to take a look at the next facet of our life with Jesus uh, that we have in this definition. Our desire to be obedient to him and to be transformed by him. And again, in this mutual and intentional relationship, we are to grow in our desire to be obedient to him and to be transformed by him. And here's something I've said before, even this morning, and I'm going to say again and again and again, and I need us to understand this, that this must flow. Our obedience to him must flow out of our life with Jesus. And when we first started this Life with Jesus series, I, I gave a story, a story of a Christian woman who experiences nearly constant guilt and shame because she has long suffered from the same sinful pattern in her life that she has not had an opportunity to gain freedom from. She tries to resist temptation, but the harder she fights, the harder it seems to resist the temptation. And then she's overcome with guilt and shame upon guilt and shame upon guilt and shame. Her friends at church don't even know about it. She does a good job of keeping her mask firmly on her face and her struggles behind the mask. She always worries that those around her are going to see through the mask, that are going, to under, are going to learn about what is going on on the inside, that she's an utter mess. And she knows she needs to do better. She knows she needs to be better. But she just keeps failing. She wonders, how could God possibly still love me? How on earth did I even get here? And I know that this is probably something that many people resonate with, this, this, this concept. And again, we're going to take a look at this today and why this is such a common problem, a common misunderstanding, as we don't always focus first on our life with Jesus, but look at Christianity possibly a little wrongly or from the wrong end. And we'll take a look at that in a minute. Here's a common misunderstanding, and I say a common misunderstanding, not just among Christians, but among the whole world. Here's just some of them in quotes. You've probably heard some of them. God is a cosmic killjoy. Christianity is just a bunch of rules, things you can't do and things you can do, or things you must do. Christianity stands in the way of human flourishing. I've heard that in the news recently. Christianity stays in, uh, stands in the way of self-expression. Christianity is repressive. Have you heard some of these? I hear these all the time, by the way. All of these accusations assert the same thing, that Christianity is all about obedience, that Christianity is reduced down to a bunch of rules, a bunch of do's and don'ts, and demands obedience of his followers. Further, that obedience is not only forced on Christians, but Christians go on and enforce these rules on everybody else. Now, I hope that you're thinking, well, that's not how I view Christianity. I sure hope it's not. But this is the, this is the picture that many have of Christianity in the world. And believe it or not, this is the picture that either many Christians have, or if they don't intellectually assent to that picture, they live as though that picture were true. So the question, does this accurately represent God? Does this accurately represent Christianity? Absolutely not. But how can I say that? After all, if you look back at the Old Testament, it contains 613 laws for the Israelites to follow. How many laws? Now, you didn't know there was going to be a quiz, did you? The Old Testament has 613 laws. If I gave you a piece of paper and a pen right now, and I told you to write out 613 laws that we have here in the United States, would you be able to do that? Israel had to follow 613 laws. Same God, same Bible, right? Even in the New Testament, it has statements such as this by Jesus, ready? John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. 
Matthew 5, 48. Ready? Here's, there's, here's, the, here's where the bar is. If you ever wondered how good is good enough, right? Jesus says it, Matthew 5, 48. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Raise your hand if you have met that goal. But do you see why it's easy to get this picture in our heads that Christianity is really about a bunch of rules. It's about the things you can't do and the things that you must do. Uh, in the Old Testament, we had 613 laws given to Moses, given to Israel. In the New Testament, Jesus continues in the same vein. If you love me, keep my commandments. Be perfect. None of us have attained that goal, right? So do, don't such passages prove that Christianity really is just a bunch of rules that we're called to be obedient to? I'm going to say no. And the reason why lies in what we've been talking about for the past several weeks, that we are not just supposed to hold on to this list and check off the boxes or, you know, adhere to a list of do's and don'ts. That's not what the essence of Christianity is. The essence of Christianity is this, that we have been called to an intentional and mutual relationship with God, and we need to understand and prioritize that first, and from that, everything else that God expects of us will flow. For those of us who are married, would it make any sense at all for somebody to say this? Oh my goodness, your spouse is so repressive because you can't go and have an affair with other people. Would that make any sense at all? Your, marriage, your spouse is so repressive because he or she will not let you go and do whatever with whoever. No, none of us would think that. How about your spouse is so repressive, I can't believe in your marriage, you're expected to do things around the house. That's terrible. Uh, you have to eat dinner with the family instead of going out all the time with your buddies, right? And you're not allowed to just spend all the family money on anything you want. I cannot believe how repressive your spouse is. Why did you even marry that person? Would any of us think that those were valid accusations? Do we understand how ridiculous it is to even think about such things? Why? Because again, that's within the context of a mutual and intentional relationship between a husband and a wife. And the same is true when we consider the relationship we're called into with the Lord. Are there boundaries? Are there expectations? Absolutely. But it's not reduced down to a list of do's and don'ts as if we were apart from the context of a loving, mutual, and intentional relationship. Yes, one could argue that we should obey God because God is God. Have you heard this? Why should we obey? Because God is God. I, I agree with that in theory, but the truth of the matter is no one did this. Here is Paul recapping several Old Testament passages that the truths that were portrayed in the Old Testament still true in Paul's day, still true in our day. Here's what Paul says in Romans 3, verses 10 through 18. He says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace, they don't know it. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So ought we to obey God because God is God? Sure. But apparently we can't do that as the human race. No one has throughout the entirety of human history. And so while that's true, we need more. If we are called to be obedient to God, how is that even possible? And we're going to talk about that again. The, I'll, give you the, I'll give you the answer at the beginning. Our life with Jesus. And we're going to talk about this. What is the context in which people actually do desire to be obedient to God? Again, within the context of that relationship that we have with him. Throughout the Bible, we see God establish covenant relationships, both with individuals and with groups of people. 
And these covenants were mutual and intentional relationships between God and human beings. And within the context of those mutual and intentional relationships, there are expectations that exist on all parties. There are expectations for God in this relationship, and there are expectations for the human participants in these relationships. Much like I take you to be my wife or my husband, to have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, forsaking all others until we are parted by death. How many of you have said vows such, so similar to that at some point in your life? My wife's going to kill me. Again, I ask you to raise your hands. How else am I supposed to know you're not sleeping? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I am just kidding. But what happens to such vows in a marriage when we neglect the relationship with our spouse? You know, I think many couples, even couples that are still together, have had hard seasons in life. And we might identify why some of those seasons were really hard seasons. What happens when, you know, we start to neglect those relationships, when we don't intentionally pursue, intentionally lean in, intentionally nurture the relationships we have with our spouse? What happens to those vows that we made at the altar? Do we not become more tempted by people who are not our spouses, jeopardizing the forsaking all others clause? Do we not become tempted by divorce, jeopardizing the for better or for worse clause? Do our marriages not lose their joy, jeopardizing the to love and to cherish part of those vows? If we don't lean in and intentionally invest constantly in these relationships, doesn't it become harder to uphold the boundaries or the moral standards or those things we've committed to in our relationship with our spouse? Friends, what happens when we neglect our relationship with God? What happens when we neglect the life with Jesus that we're called to be in? Again, we often think of this as a one-sided thing. We receive well from God, right? Man, I, I have no problem receiving the blessings that God gives me. But how often are we intentional about leaning in and also being committed to fostering, nurturing that relationship that we have with him? What happens when we neglect it? It becomes very easy, even as Christians, to see Christianity now as a set of rules a list of do's and don'ts, obstacles to our personal freedom, a chore, a burden, a heavy yoke to bear. Because outside of the context of our continually nurturing this relationship with the Lord, those things become more difficult. Conversely, when we nurture that relationship with Jesus, those things come more naturally as we seek not only to do those things, but that within us wells up a desire to please him. Here's what happens when we nurture our relationship with Jesus, our life with Jesus, and I want to explore this together. Here's some things. First, we recognize that our value does not stem from our obedience. If you remember back to the example of the Christian woman who is just constantly defeated by falling to the same sin over and over again and wrestling with guilt and shame behind her mask always. How could God even love me? How on earth did I get here? She forgot an important thing, that her value does not stem from her obedience. And the same is true for all of us. Our value does not stem from our obedience. God doesn't love us more for being more obedient. God doesn't love us less if we're less obedient. We cannot earn more of his favor by doing better. We cannot pay him back for the things that he's done for us. Our value does not stem from our obedience. And I'd argue that the more we nurture our life with Jesus, the more we understand and experience this, the more we understand where our true value does come from. And here's the thing. The more we nurture our life with Jesus, the more that we start to recognize that God loves us perfectly. God loves us maximally. Nothing could be added to it. He couldn't possibly love you anymore because God loves perfectly. We recognize the more we lean into our life with Jesus that, guess what? Jesus paid it all. 
every sin, past, present, and future, Jesus is already paid for. God doesn't hold our sins over our heads. We've already been adopted as God's sons and daughters, and it's in the context of this relationship that our value is truly found, that we are loved unconditionally by God who calls us his children because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And this is where our value comes from. Again, when we nurture our life with Jesus, we recognize that our value does not stem from our obedience. That doesn't mean we're not called to be obedient. But that's not where our value comes from. So when we fall flat on our face, he's not the God who's ready to condemn us. He's the God who loves us. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us and purify us and continue to love us always. Second, as we lean in to our life with Jesus, we grow in our desire to be obedient to him. Not just our capacity to be obedient to him, but in our very desire, our will. We want to be obedient to God. We want to please those we love, don't we? And this is even easier when we've nurtured that relationship with the people that we love. When we nurture our relationship with Jesus, we take more notice of answered prayers. We recognize his presence more, even in the mundane times and aspects of our life. Uh, We grow in our understanding and appreciation of him when we read the scriptures. We recognize when he shows up in the midst of ministry or in sharing the gospel with other people. When this is happening, being obedient to him doesn't seem like a chore. Instead, we desire to please the Lord even more. Third, we recognize that it is only from our life with Jesus that we even have the capacity to do the things he's called us to. It is in our life with Jesus that we have a growing capacity to do the things that he's called us to do, to live in obedience to him. And this is because a life that is focused in on the relationship between us and Jesus is one that is led by the Holy Spirit. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to be starting at verse 13. Galatians 5, 13. If you don't have your Bible with you, it will also be up on the screen for you today. But we will be in Galatians 5, starting in verse 13. And here's what it says. Paul's writing to various churches in Galatia. And here's what he says. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. We looked at this passage in Sunday school this morning and had an opportunity to make several important observations. I encourage you, even after we've left here today, to go back to this passage and really dig in because there's A lot more in here than we're able to really have time for this morning. But here's what I want you to see. That before we came to faith in Jesus, 
We did things that we didn't even know were wrong. It didn't dawn on us, perhaps. Have you heard this before by non Christians, especially? Why can't I do that? I'm not hurting anyone. Who are you to say that's wrong? Have you heard this before? I'm not going to make you raise your hands, but I, heard that, I hear this all the time. Not only do I hear this all the time, but I gave this excuse. You know, I know I, I came to faith at 16 years old, and just letting you know, in case you don't remember back that far, um, you know, by 16, you could do a lot of bad things. But, you know, there's things that you do in life, and you're like, yeah, I know it's bad, and whoo, I got away with that one, Right? But then there are things that you do apart from Christ that you don't even recognize are bad. In fact, if I go and tell my brother who's a, a salesperson who's trying to out, you know, he's competing with his fellow salespeople and he's, he's trying to, uh, you know, climb that ladder. If I said selfish ambition is bad, he'd be like, what are you talking about? That's the goal of life. Climb as high as you can on that ladder. Make as much money as you can. What's wrong with that? Putting yourself first. Well, why should I be concerned with other people? These are things that you don't even recognize sometimes if you are not a Christian. Why? How do we know that it's wrong? How do we know? Well, first, the scriptures say it. But second, the key is right here. That we are called to a spirit-led life. And it's the Holy Spirit who gives us eyes to see who moved us from death to life, who gave us new life in Christ, a new perspective, a new worldview, who continues to speak to our hearts. And guess what? The things that the world pursues, the things that the world thinks is good, or the world says, well, you can't say that's wrong. God has made a moral decision on that. These are the things that stand opposed to God. These are the things that please God. And those that are led by the Spirit know the difference. But not only do we know the difference because we have the Spirit, but we're called to follow the Spirit where he leads. In fact, that's mentioned three different times in this text. That even as a Christian, even as a Christian who has the Holy Spirit of God indwelling us, even as a Christian who who has a life with Jesus, who's been saved by grace through faith, we have the Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us so that we might continue to put to death those aspects of our life that resemble the old life, the ways of the world, and to embrace this new life that he has called for us to have in Jesus Christ. But here's the thing. Christianity is not just a list of do's and don'ts that we have to kind of level up to, but God has given us everything that we need in order to live in such a way that pleases him. Because as we follow the Spirit, He is leading us in the direction we should go. And the more we do that, the more within us we even have a desire to do it, and we find we have the capacity to live as He's called us to live. You know, for many years, I'll give you this example. When I first came to faith in Jesus, right away there were several things that I recognized were patterns of sin in my life that just fell away. In a moment, my swearing that had just become a natural part of my communication was gone in an instant. Smoking, I just, I went from addicted to cigarettes as a teenager to not needing even a single one. There were other things, attitudes, the way I looked at things, the way I treated my brother, all these things, a lot of things just slapped immediately. And I know that's not everybody's story. Sometimes God lets you drop something real fast and sometimes God makes you work through it or you know go through a season as weeks went by I recognized that not all my bad tendencies went away I had some more that stuck with me and I fought against these things and you know what I realized that it was that in me was this motivation God did all this for me he sent Jesus to die on a cross so that I could be forgiven I owe it to him to stop doing this and to start doing that. And so I forced myself. I was like, I have to resist this temptation. I can't do that anymore. I can't talk to that person that way. I, and I have to start doing this. And you know what I found? I wasn't much different from that Christian woman example that I gave you. I kept falling flat on my face. I kept tripping over the same stupid things I knew I wasn't supposed to do. 
And the things I was supposed to do, I didn't do them well or with any kind of regularity. You know what I realized I needed? Help. You know where, God, where I found that help? It's something that I had had from that moment I put my faith and trust in Jesus. Because he has given us everything we need to have the capacity to be obedient to him, to do the things he's called us to do. He's given us his Holy Spirit. He is the power. But we can't just go and ignore him and go do our own thing. We have to follow him as he leads. And we have to trust in him. And we need to pray. And we need to keep God in the midst of our struggling through our sin and in our, trying to, in our, in our attempts to live for him. So again, our life with Jesus gives us the growing capacity to live in obedience to him. Again, that Christian woman who it could be a man, I've had 15 different people in my life that have had the same story that they shared with me of frustration and hiding from others and hiding from God because they saw themselves as a failure in living to what God has called them to live to. This Christian woman, her frustration stemmed from seeing Christianity as nothing but a set of rules. She failed to see that her values stem from her relationship with God and not by how she measured up on her own. And so instead of taking comfort in her relationship with God, in the value that's placed on her by God himself, she pushed God farther and farther away as she felt like she was a failure, not able to live up to his commands and expectations. She couldn't grow in obedience apart from being transformed by the Spirit, which stems from nurturing her life with Jesus. So friends, let me ask you some questions. And these are rhetorical questions or questions for you to reflect on. Please don't raise your hand for this portion. But let me ask you this. Have you been apathetic toward the entire issue of obedience to Jesus? Do you come to church on Sunday, you read a Bible passage every now and then, but you really don't let your life be transformed according to how God would want you to live, avoiding the things he doesn't want you to do, and pursuing the things he wants you to do. Have you just not even thought about it at all? Have you been apathetic toward the whole issue of obedience to Jesus? Have you been different than that? Have you been hyper-concerned by obedience to Jesus but for the wrong reasons? Have you been... I have to do this, so I'm doing this. this is a, have, you been, have you been pursuing a list of rules because you know you're supposed to keep the list of rules? Have you failed repeatedly in the same area over and over and over again, maybe for years, without victory in that area? Friends, it is imperative, if you fall into any of these categories, that you turn your attention to your life with Jesus right now. Because we can tell, all of these other things are symptoms of a root cause, right? If we have a real bad problem and we just treat the symptom, the root problem is not fixed. And all of these things we want to turn our attention to when we recognize a problem, but the root problem is often this, that we have neglected our life with Jesus. And we need to first and foremost pursue that which is the foundation for everything else. Because out of the overflow of your life with Jesus, everything else flows. It's imperative that you turn to Jesus right now. Invest in that mutual and intentional relationship that he has called you to. He welcomes you to, and he will not shun you away from. He wants you to avail yourself of. Develop a life with Jesus through, through which a desire to be obedience will be cultivated in your heart and mind. As you spend time with Jesus, as you're silent before him, as you speak to him in prayer, as you read the Bible, not as a, a study guide, but as a, a way to engage with him, as you're cognizant of his presence throughout your day, as, as you invest in your relationship with Jesus, guess what? In you is going to be developed a desire to please him, a desire to honor him, a desire to obey him. And also in this, that you will be, you will want to be transformed by his spirit, enabling you to grow in your obedience to him. You know, often in the New Testament, he says, you know, be transformed, be renewed. I mean, there's these, these terms he uses over and over again to describe 
what we ought to pursue, what we ought to desire. We ought to desire the Spirit to transform us, to lead us, to fill us, to renew us, to continue to make us new. Because when we believed in Jesus, when we put our faith and trust in him, when we committed to him as Lord, when we believed the gospel, we, were, we at that point and onward stand rightly before God. But he's still doing a work in us. So that when we stand before him in glory, we have been perfected. We have been made into the image of Jesus. And the more we do this in our life, the more we surrender to that sanctifying work of God through the Holy Spirit, the stronger our testimony will be as we proclaim the gospel to those who need to hear it in our midst. So I encourage you, friends, this afternoon, go and begin the journey or continue the journey of your life with Jesus, pursuing him first and trusting these other things will follow. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for your goodness, for your love, for your grace. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us everything we need to be in this relationship with you. And Lord, we thank you that in the relationship that we have with you, yes, there are things that we're called to be, called to do, called not to do. And Lord, those are given for our good. In the same way that there are expectations on marriages, expectations on friendships, expectations on relationships between parents and children, expectations on... Every relationship comes with quote-unquote rules, expectations, things that foster the good of the relationship, things that better the participants of the relationship. We thank you, Lord, that you have included those in our relationship with you, that there is a way you call us to live, that there are things you ask us to avoid or instruct us to avoid, but we thank you, Lord, that you haven't based our value, our worth, or your love for us on our obedience or disobedience. We thank you that you have given us the Holy Spirit so that we have the capacity to live the way you've called us to live. We thank you that you've given us this life with Jesus, that as we intentionally pursue it, our desire to be obedient to you grows. Lord, if we struggle in any of these areas, may we wake up right now and recognize what you have given us, provided for us, so that we can live in such a way as to please you and to enjoy every minute of it. We thank you for this, in Jesus' name. Amen.